we've been talking about the five skandhas. The five skandhas is a Sanskrit word for body of mind. What am I make up of? What are you make up of? We are make up of the body and mind. We are the creation of the five skandhas. When the five skandhas come together, we are created. We exist. When the five skandhas do not come together, or the five skandhas do not happen at all, we didn't have any existence. We are created by causality, by all these five skandhas come together, then you have we, we have us. Rupa, Vedana, Zamsna, Zamskara, and Vujnana. So we know that the body is form or the solidity, which include everything about us, our organs, our senses, our eyes and nose, yeah, we know all about that. And Vedana, it's sensations of feelings. We have the six organs, the eye, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind, in contact with the six sense objects, form, sound, smell, taste, body, and impressions, and mental objects. And of course, in Vedana, Zamsna, Samskara, and Vijnana, it's all mentality, mental. Mental is subjective. Rupa, matter, is objective. The subjective perceives the objective. So when you say something is objective, there's objective that exists, that's matter. It objectively exists. But when we think about it, when we perceive it, we subjectively perceive it. We subjectively think about it, analyze about it. When we see things, when we use our senses to see things, of course, in sensation, we have the six organs, right? We use eyes, ears, nose, etc., and etc. The five scanters is only generalizing the body and mind. The Buddha wants us to get into more details by giving us more details in the eight in the eighteen rams. So it is the five scanters can be broken down further into the six organs, the six objects, and the six consciousnesses, which is the, eight, the 18, three six is 18, 18 rams, because when we visualize the 18 rams, we can visualize body and mind in a much detailed perspective. Before we go back to the detail, which we already cover, let's talk about this generalization. Rupa, we understand it objectively. This is, everything is Rupa, form. Molecules, elements, combinations of protons, electrons, that we know. But how about the subjective? The subjective, our senses, our thinking. When we perceive through our senses, getting sensation, senses lead to sensations. Sensations have three, we have three kinds of sensations. Pleasant sensation, unpleasant sensation, and neutral sensations, which cover all, all sensations. It's either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. When we perceive, when we use our senses, we perceive through senses. When we perceive through our senses, sometimes you call it, or some scientists call it, empirical. Empirical? So we say empirical evidences. Um, all our senses contact empirically objects. So we also call reality existent as empirical reality. This is an empirical reality. It is different from experiential thinking. Empirical thinking, empirical perception relates to what? Relates to the senses perceiving objectively outer things. When we use our senses, we attach to what we can touch, what we can see, uh, what we can hear, what we can taste. So empirical evidences sometimes could be illusory. Everybody could be a little different in the empirical senses. But we have generally, we, we agree with each other when we see something red, and, and, unless you're colorblind which is abnormal, then we say, this is red. We hear a, 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 a traffic honking, then we say, oh, there's honking. When we hear the dog bark, everybody says, oh, there's a hot dog bark. Of course, there are some people 
who heard the dogs bark, barking as the howling of a wolf. I mean, everybody's a little different. It's all illusory. It, it depends on how you perceive. So senses are not trustworthy. Generally, senses are right, normally are right. That's the reason why when the scientists perform experiments, those experiments are based on what? Empirical evidences, sense of evidences. So scientists may be wrong because one theory could be proven in 20 years later to be wrong. A theory 100 years ago could be proven wrong now because the senses they used were not right. Many, many years ago, they thought that uh, philosophers and scientists using telescopes thought that this is the only world. We have a boundary. And now we know that it's unlimited because our telescope, the invention of a telescope has become more advanced. We discovered that all these other theories about, about astronomy, some of these theories were proven wrong. So we cannot just blindly believe that science is all right. I mean, science is flawless. Science is everything. Because science is based on empirical evidences. So empirical evidences is watching out. It's not introspective. It's extrospective. Always watching out. That's empirically. Could be wrong. But the Buddha said, we cannot trust our senses. We have to go introspectively to see what we are seeing. The Buddha's teaching is not on what you are seeing, it's to research on how you see it. The process of seeing it. Is what you're seeing wrong or right? You see the difference? Right now we just believe in what we see. And the Buddha said, you have to know how you see it. Then you know how right you are and how wrong you are. So that's what we call experiential thinking. Experiential thinking has to be introspective, getting inside your mind to see it. So in other words, looking at the process of perception, looking at the process of seeing things, listening things, tasting things, is called experiential thinking. You have to turn from empirical thinking to experiential thinking. Otherwise, you will always not get enlightened. And this is exactly what the Buddha is talking about in the five scantus. Other than rupa, you've got to know your sensation, your conception, your volition, and your consciousness. And also, empirical thinking is bounded by the four dimensions. What are these four dimensions? Space and time. Space have what? The length, the breadth, and the width. The three dimensions. Space is three dimensions. The length, the width, and the breadth, right? How can we with our width, with our length, with our breadth? So we have length, a breadth, and a width. The fourth dimension is what? Time. So we have time and space. We have four dimensions. When you are bound by space and time, how do you observe your pace, space and time with? You observe and perceive your, pace, your space and time with what? With senses. But actually, space and time does not exist. You understand what I mean? Let's talk about time. Let's just talk about time. Space is easier to deal with. Time is more difficult to deal with. Let's deal with the difficult thing first. What is time? Time contains the past, the present, and the future. Time is a product of empirical thinking. Empirically, time. Because you look at your watch, you look at yesterday, tomorrow. Time is past, but when you think about it, does the past exist now? The past does not exist. When I look at, look at some of the old photos yesterday, about my own photos when I was young, all of a sudden, I didn't have any interest in looking at it. When people look at nostalgic photographs, they say, oh, this is how I look. Oh, this is how nice. This is my mom, my dad. This is my, my girlfriend, you know, all these things. But when I look at it, all of a sudden, it's, I'm looking at awareness. 
because time only lives in memory. If you don't have memory, you don't have the you don't have the past. You you forgot about the past. If you if you don't have memory, do you have a past? If someone is is there and he couldn't remember anything, he didn't have a past. Well, how about our future? People say we have a future, but the future hasn't come yet. How can you say the future exists? The future certainly doesn't exist now, but you say the future exists in in tomorrow. But how can something that hasn't come exist? If you say that something hasn't come exist, that's strange. It's not logical. Something that hasn't come actually exist. Then we say, okay, no. Then how about the present? We、we'll、live at the present moment. The present exists. But every minute is ticking. Every existence, you call it existence now, is actually become a past immediately. It takes every every second. So how can the present exist? So time is only a product of empirical sensual perception. There's no such thing. There's no time. But we live in empirical existence of time, and we always talk about existence. We've been illusioned by existence. You you you. We live in illusion. We don't even we don't even know about it. We always talk about when you talk about to people who always ask you that that question. How about existence? What's the beginning? Is there a beginning? Who created? If if there's no God, then who create things? Who's, who? If there's no God, how? What's the beginning? Beginning and the end only lives in the time. It, it, it is only a product of time. You see the 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 the, the, the problem of having a big of, of arguing about existence of the beginning. Even Lao Chi, a, a very an ancient philosopher in China, at approximately the same time as the Buddha, even Lao Chi, talk about the beginning. You know what he talk about the beginning? If there was a beginning, then there must be a time before that beginning, right? If we assume that yesterday is the beginning, then there must be a day before yesterday. If there was a beginning, then there must be a time before that beginning, and a time before the time, which was before the time of that beginning. So you fall into the problem of infinity. You can't have a beginning, because beginning has a beginning, beginning has a beginning. You fall into the argument of infinity. You contradicting yourself, and then it's for the same reason. If that is existence, we say, okay, that is existence. There must have been non-existence. If you say something exists a hundred years ago, suddenly something exists a hundred years existed a hundred years ago. So there must be something that exists before that hundred years ago. So if that is an existence, there must have been non-existence. Something does not exist before that existence. And if there was a time when nothing existed, then there must have been a time when even nothing did not exist. <laughs> you know what I mean? All of a sudden, we're talking about something that doesn't mean anything. We're talking about nothing came into existence. We could one then really say whether it belongs to the category of existence or non-existence. Even the very words that I have uttered didn't say anything. We said nothing at all. There's no existence. Why do we talk about existence? If we put that into the category of empirical existence, that's all delusion. So don't talk about existence. Don't talk about time. Don't talk about the four dimensions. They're all living within the empirical thinking, and empirical thinking is not trustworthy. Empirical thinking is out of the, our uncon unconscious self, because it works in our unconscious self. We have been doing everything unconsciously, and the Buddha said, "Come to a conscious state now. Don't be unconscious." You think when we hate, we consciously hate? Yes, sometimes we consciously hate. We consciously greedy. We consciously become mad. But most of the time, we are unconsciously getting into anger. We're unconsciously getting into hatred, hatred, 
we are unconsciously getting into greediness. We are unconscious. And we don't even know, we don't even know, we haven't even awakened, awakened from the unconsciousness state. That's why we are confused. We're not the Buddha. When we are totally enlightened consciously, we are the Buddha.